You're listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Get the knowledge you need to advance your mortgage practice quickly and efficiently from Jen Duplessis, America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor with over 37 years of experience and over $1 billion in lifetime fundings. Jen has been mentoring loan officers and realtors for over 15 years and speaking on stages across the globe. So settle in and get ready as Jen and her guests share their experience passion, and strategies to help you crack the top producer code to reach new heights in your business. And now, here's your host, Jen Duplessis, Mortgage Mastery Mentor and Head Chick in Charge of Kinetic Spark Consulting. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Mortgage Lending Mastery. I'm your host, Jen Duplessis. I'm so happy that you joined us today. And by the way, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Welcome to our community, and I hope that you decide to stay for a long time. And for those of you that have been listening for five and a half years, I want to continue to say thank you so much for supporting this podcast. We are number one ranked in our industry, and I appreciate that that continues to happen with the wonderful guests that we bring on to the show. So today, I want to introduce our guest, uh, Liz Hofer. She is, or Lizzie, I'm sorry, gosh, I do this every time. Lizzie Hofer, I'm going to just be quiet for a second and have them. You're not worried. I'm not. (laughs) I want to introduce our guest today, Lizzie Hofer. She is the number one woman loan officer in the nation as ranked by Scotsman's Guide in 2019, as well as the number one Hispanic real estate or loan officer in, um, is ranked by NAHREP. Uh, in 2019, and she's a senior loan officer um, who proves every day that passion changes everything. So we're going to dig into that. That's something that's really important with me. So welcome to the show, Lizzie. Happy to have you. Oh my God. Thank you. It's such an honor. You're a legend. Everyone knows who you are. Everyone's like, oh my God, you're going to be on our podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. That's very humbling. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So now I know you've been in the mortgage business for 17 years and you know, you got in like most of us did. It's it's funny. You and I were on another, um, we were on a town hall or something. And, uh, you know, your story uh, kind of mirrored mine. I went in saying mortgage, mortgage. I don't even know how to spell it. I Rates were 18 and a half percent, and I didn't even know what percent was. And I was a receptionist slash setup clerk, <laughs> kind of the way that you started as well. And uh, that's crazy. So you, so you kind of uh, gone up the ranks and things like that. And I want to, I want to focus on several things that you're doing um, in your practice or that got you to this point, you know, so being the number one, so what is your ranking in the top, in the, in the um, Scotsman's Guide as a whole? What is your ranking? Um, I think in 2020, I was 10. Okay. 10. Number 10. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to talk about how you got to this place, not so much about what you're doing now. We will talk about that, but I'd love to talk about how you got to this space, um, this part of it. And I know one of the things now, now to give some people some context here on what you did, you closed uh, 980 loans in 2019. So that's an average of about 18 a week, right? Most people are looking for 18 referrals a week not 18 closings, right? Um, so there's a pattern that you created um, that way back, wherever it was that you, that you uh, put into play and you know, that created this opportunity for you to get a, you know, an exorbitant amount of referrals. So I'd like to go back to that because I know that one of the things that you say about your, your team and your, your practice is that you're passionate about your clients. Um, you have a, a killer process and your business partners. So let's talk about those three areas as it relates to how you started building this, um, this empire and where, where were the triggers in this that really took you from one level to poof, really blew you up? Um, well, the, the very first thing that I think you really have to understand the math behind metrics, right? And so Mm -hmm. if you focus 100% on conversion and like the metrical goals versus the actual closing goals, you will have so much more success. For me, early on, I realized I need 42 agents closing a half a deal a month to have a, a really 
kick ass business. Sorry. Right. Um, so I just knew that. And so for me, that was like the very first thing I was like, well, how do I get 42 agents that want to send me business and agents that are doing a half deal. So we're talking about six deals a year. Yeah. Um, right. What kind of, what are their biggest concerns? What are their biggest problems? How can I be a solution, you know, problem solver for them? And so I really created a business around educating them on finance principles, on taking the hard deals, um, you know, on really just teaching them basic Buffini principles. Cause I, I started my selling career using yeah. Brian Buffini system. Who oh, I I'm a Buffini guy too. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just, it was all about how could I provide these people value? And then once I realized that providing them value also meant teaching them about business, that 42, right? If they each did one transaction a month, I could then double my business. And if I could teach them how to do three deals a month, then I would triple my business. And so that's really what the focus came down to for me. It was figuring out the math, right? Yeah. So the average yeah. real estate agent in my time, they did six, eight, six deals a year, right? I didn't try to go for the top, top. I just went for the people that I could provide the most value to. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, and, and especially, uh, you know, even now as we're as we're recording this today, we're in COVID, but we won't be released for quite some time. But even now, one of the, the challenges, and I even heard you say this too, but, but one of the challenges that I'm seeing with a lot of loan officers and with real estate agents, um, in fact, tomorrow I'm doing this big um, coach-a-thon online because there's a lack of knowledge in uh, what, um, you know, the market, how, what drives markets and how markets happen. And as, in a re as a result, you know, the people, the clients who are looking to us for the guidance, uh, we're kind of hiding behind that and saying, well, I don't really understand everything about it. So therefore I don't, because I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the confidence to talk to my clients. And I've always found that that's an issue in the lending and mortgage space is just understanding the tact down to the very tactical, tactical, how do loans get sold, et cetera, right? Um, so how, tell, us, tell us about how you've been sharing that with realtors, you know, especially, especially now as we're going through, you know, pandemic and they don't really understand. There's a lot of them that don't understand what's really happening with what I call the, the hidden pandemic of mortgage and real estate. Yeah, for me, it's, I've always been very open and transparent with them. So again, my entire platform is based on how do I prepare them and give them the tools to help sell, mm -hmm. right? So for me, it's about educating them in a way that makes sense, that's easy to transfer information on from me to them, to their client. And so part of that is explaining things that clients will be hearing in the news, um, explaining why it matters, explaining why it impacts interest rates. And so for me, it's, it's just what I believe is so important right now. Uh, but I don't try to get into too much of the nitty gritty details. It's like, what, what are the big bullet points they're going to be hearing in the news that their clients are going to be, you know, repeating yeah, the back to them? And then yeah. How yeah. do I educate them and give them the best tactical advice? I will say that, you know, that's one of the, the frustrations that I have is that most loan officers don't really understand the market. They don't really understand financial principles. They do understand mortgage guidelines. They understand what it takes to get a loan done, but they give really poor financial advice. And I think that that's something that really needs to change. But in a market like this one, where everyone is starved for information, they're freaked out, they're worried that they're not going to have incomes. They seek people like me who are giving information out so freely right? Because then we seem like the more stable thing. So in economies like this, my stock actually rises, right? So like yeah. the market share that we have increases. And it's because people's fear of the unknown makes us the attractor, right? Because we're giving the information out. So if I was a loan officer right now, and I didn't have this information, I would sign up for Reuters. I would sign up for Mortgage News Daily. I would sign up for MBS Highway. I would start educating myself as much as I could and figuring out a really good communication stream to educate people in layman's terms. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and, you know, I think that that's very powerful, very, very powerful. And I know that you do that through YouTube. So YouTube is, is probably your, your biggest stream. Is that correct? Or, or are there other methods that you're reaching out and giving the, delivering this information to people? Um, I actually, YouTube is fairly new to me. I've only been doing it for a year. Okay. Um, so for me, I have an email newsletter that I've had for a really long time. 
Um, I have, you know, probably about six or 7,000 people that follow me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the same amount that have subscribed to that newsletter. Um, and I'm on pretty much all of the channels, but I would say that they're all fairly, um, I have the same little tribe that follows me everywhere. Yeah. That I love the door. Yes. But I do put out a lot of video content. Yeah. And I do like your videos. I was, you know, I do research on everybody <laughs> before I bring them on. And I like how easy your videos are. You know, one of the challenges that I hear from loan officers all the time is I don't have any content, but you know, the bottom line is we're asked a thousand questions every day. And that becomes the content because that's the inquiry that people have. And so how do you um, pool all of that information to decide what you're going to do in a podcast? I mean, in a um, YouTube video. You know, um, for me, my YouTube is really about teaching financial practices. And so for me, I just, I'm giving and teaching what I'm most passionate about, right? So I wouldn't necessarily say, to recommend that to everyone, but there is a zone of genius that everybody has within their business that makes them super excited to get up and educate, talk, that if they listen to people talking about it next door, they'd want to interrupt or interject in the conversation. If you feel that and you notice that, that's the thing that you should be creating content around because you'll have endless ideas. It won't be a chore, right? You'll want to wake up every day and do it. And so for me, teaching people basic financial currency is super important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is your, what was your background before getting into lending? I've never worked in anything else. Okay. So this is just, basically yeah, my I only was just background. Curious. Yeah. Me either. Never have. <laughs> um, okay. No, I was just curious because, uh, you know, you talk a lot about the financial piece of it. Um, so are you a CMPS? I am not. Okay. So I literally, so what I am though, is I, I have, um, multiple seven figures in the bank. I've been a multiple seven figure earner for a very long time. And, you know, I have come from really nothing. You know, my mom was a single mom who worked two jobs. My dad was a serial entrepreneur, you know, um, it was difficult for them to pass on any really solid financial advice. And so when I got out of college at college, I owed $50,000. It was like $48,000 in student loans, like 10,000 in credit card debt and a car I couldn't afford and a house I couldn't afford. And, um, I was just like, how did I get into this place? <laughs> and, you know, just getting out of there and really understanding finances and doing my own research and getting mentors that were more successful than I was, has allowed me the opportunity to become more successful. And I just think that it's so important, especially in this era to teach people how to multiply their, their funds. Right. Um, and there's so many, you know, like I don't want to knock him, but I love Dave Ramsey's audience. The fact that, you know, he has really educated and created this platform on being debt free. But if you're debt free, chances are you're going to be working forever. Yeah. And if you don't know how to leverage, chances are you're going to be working forever. And so I don't want people to be afraid of money or finance. I want them to understand it. I want them to lean into it and I want them to figure out ways to create multiple streams of income. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So <clears throat> when you talk, I want to go back to the metrics is for a second here. From a scalability point, if someone is, I just want to go down to the, the bottom lender, right? The lender who, you know, scarcely does 15 million a year, you know, one year and maybe 13 the next year, right? And, um, and they're just, you know, saying, look, I've been in the business a long time. I know my guidelines. I know a bunch of people. Why can't I get any traction? What do you see as the number one problem with that particular type of loan officer who just sort of meanders along year after year after year? Um, well, I'm, so the one positive about me is I'm just very honest. Um, but most of the time you meet those people and they're just not very coachable and they're not very likable. They think about themselves. They're not thinking about how to provide value to other people. They pride themselves on all of the guidelines that they know versus how they can really impact somebody's life. And when you're thinking about you too much, it's very hard to grow. It's very hard to be stable. It's very hard to make phone calls. Um, you know, because you look at it from a point of view, like you're going to be bothering people and you would be bothering people if that was the place that you came from. Right. right. So if you focus all of your attention and energy on what value you can provide to other people, it's a lot easier to prospect. It's a lot easier to have conversations deep in your relationships, get referrals because it's about other people and not about you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. That's wonderful. So can you give us an example of, you know, someone's listening and they say, you know, okay, this is it. I'm going to call and I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try to help people. But what's the best way for them to do that? What would be a good strategy, a good script, a good way, you know, or one idea that they could give to a realtor? If all they did was take one idea and they just went crazy with that one idea, what would, what would that look like to get this started? Jump started. So um, I think it's more foundational than just an idea. Um, I think you have to really figure out what, where you provide value. So mm -hmm. one of the most important things that I've done for my business is really look at the type of clientele that I serve. Mm -hmm. And so I help primarily first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. And so all of my content, all of my value, all my education classes, my marketing, everything is centered around how I help that particular client. Right. And so when I focus on the value, right, like their biggest problems, what solutions do I provide? How am I a thought leader in giving them tangible advice that they can take and implement, right? When I focus my intentions on this, I create content and value that I can hand off to my partners, right? right? right. Because my partners are the ones that are also dealing with them, right? Yeah, so, yeah. but it comes from that place of how do you provide value? When I was first starting in loans, like I just became a processor, um, I met with a, a gentleman, uh, his name is John Dyer. He actually teaches a bunch of classes here in Arizona. Uh, but he was the one who gave me that metric. He's like, you just need to know the recipe for math. Like once you know the math, you can figure anything out. And he was the one that told me about, you know, every agent did six deals and I needed 42. And so I was like, oh, great. I just need 42 agents that I can provide value to. Well, I'm a brand new loan officer. What value can I provide? And at the time, I could give them my time. Like I could sit any open house with them. Mm -hmm. um, I could, um, I knew my guidelines. I was a loan processor forever. So I could save them stress because it was a time when FHA loans were just making a comeback and very few loan officers knew how to do them. Yeah. Right. So I could do that. And then I could teach them, right. All of the Buffini things. So right for me, it's like you could make five great phone calls a day where you're providing value to other people. That's a strategy that works, but you have to know what value you're providing to make the phone call in the first place. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you too, because that is something that we probably both hear a lot is I, you know, I just want to know, I want deeper relationships and I want to, you know, provide them with value. And when I've asked my students, you know, okay, so what is the value you're going to give them? Well, I have recipe cards and I do a mailer and I, you know, and it's just crazy stuff, right? And I, and I don't think that people spend a lot of time going through that. And um, so I love hearing that because it's something that's right up my alley. And I was going to ask you if you were working with first-time homebuyers because you made that comment in, um, you know, in, in the preliminary information that we got there about a niche, right? So tell us about your feelings about niching because so many people are afraid to niche because they don't think that they think that they're cutting out everybody else around them. So what's your take on selecting a niche? So for me, it's about how can you give people something to connect with you? Mm -hmm. And so if you're the master of multiple things, right, how can anyone connect you with any of it? Right. And, um, you know, by helping first time home buyers, I also help with move up buyers. I also help them with their investment properties. I help their parents, right? So I'm not really losing any of the other business, but also you have to pick a demographic that's large enough that if that was the only clientele that you ever helped, you would have more business than you could ever think of, right? And so that's what it is for me. Um, I'm just not, I don't live in a scarce mentality just in general, right? So I just, I just, and then again, it's not really about me. It's about how many people can we impact? And I know it sounds really cheesy, but, um, there was a point in time when I really didn't understand that fundamentally. I was like, well, of course everybody just wants to help somebody. Right. Um, but I think it's when I finally realized that what we do and how we do it can have like a trickle down effect on people's actual lives later on. And that it isn't just one home loan with a stack of papers that this is literally somebody's what that what they will talk about if it's stressful in their household yeah right yeah. they will talk about the mortgage they'll talk and argue about finances once i really got my head around that right then i realized my job is a whole lot more serious yeah right yeah. and it, that just changes everything but i you know 
I just, I think that if you're really trying to figure out what your niche is, just go back into your business, look at all the clients you've helped, like 70% of the business will tell you something. Yeah. Right. And then focus on that. Yeah, it definitely will. Plus, I think it's important to, and I've said this several times in this podcast, to work with people that complement and not complicate you and your business and your team. And, um, you know, and sometimes it's a, pr a process of elimination rather than it is of selection. Like, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll work with first time home buyers. Um, but maybe I won't. I mean, if that it's a process of, uh, you know, elimination as well. I mean, do I like working with home buyer, first time home buyers? Do I like doing the government kind of, you know, not even the government loans, but the, the county and the state loans? Are these things I like to do? Because if I don't, that might not be your niche. You know, it doesn't mean you won't do them. It's just not your niche. So I love that you say that, you know, be really, really clear on it. Um, of the business that you get now, um, which comes from your realtors and, and some of the other, you know, sources that you may have as well. How much of your business is coming from your clients referring and, and do you set up that expectation at the very beginning of your um, consultation with your clients? I mean, I feel like it's a little bit of a, uh, so five years ago, I, so five, five or six years ago, I actually got fired from my job. So um, I had to restart everything from the ground up. So I didn't have a whole lot of refinance business. And so I did have to really generate all of my business like straight from real estate agents or from um, referrals from clients. So I did really focus on current client referrals, past client referrals. Um, so that definitely has been a topic where it gets a little bit hard in terms of tracking is that I associate every single lead with the referral partner it originally came with. Mm -hmm. And so like I would say somewhere between 20 to 30% actually comes from repeat business past clients, but then also can also get kind of lumped in with a, a real estate referral. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. So it's kind of hard to say, but um, mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Well, the question I have is how, when you're consulting with a client, are you, are you planting seeds that you're looking for referrals from clients or are you planting seeds that you're going to be there for the long haul with them beyond the transaction itself so that they um, come back into the buying cycle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The whole time. Our whole process is dedicated towards that and we market to them and we educate them. They get all the money tips for and indefinitely. They're part of our VIP group. They get birthday cupcakes. And right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so what about your nurturing plan post closing? What are you doing to keep in touch with them? You mentioned your newsletter, right? That you do. Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Is it digital? Are you doing a video at these, at these days? I imagine you're probably doing videos. Yeah. Just the money tip that you see on YouTube goes out in an email. Uh -huh. um, with some commentary. Um, and then I do birthday cupcakes and we have two annual events. I mean, nothing huge. I mean, I'd love, you know, most all of my clients are, so all of our clients are friends on social media. Yeah. So I don't really accept people I don't know. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, so if anyone tries to friend me, if I don't accept your friendship, it's because I try to save the spots for clients. Yeah, I know, especially nowadays, right? I'd maxed out last night again, and now I'm like, oh, I gotta go through the and figure people out. It's terrible. So what are your, um, you mentioned something about smart steps. Um, is that just what you call your, your um, educational platform? Yeah, so um, I think that the number one question that I get asked for is, you know, how much should I purchase? What can I buy? And it occurred to me that people don't have a roadmap before they get to me on what their budget should look like and how much they should be spending on their house. And so I created Smart Steps as a roadmap to teach them about practical finance, how they could be living, how they could be investing. Um, and so I, um, so I have a Smart Steps budget, an education plan, and then an online community where I teach financial principles. That's awesome. So that brings me to this question because I was just watching, uh, reading through this last night, you know, on Facebook with all the posts and stuff. And this one gal said, you know, one of the groups, she said, um, you know, I, I wish I had her exact words because it was pretty funny. I had my husband listen to it because he's still a mortgage lender. He's still originating. And I said, oh my goodness, it's not just you, you know, but she goes, I don't get it. I just got nine nine applications in and out of all of them only one has a credit score over 640 
Where do these people get, you know, get off thinking that they can buy a house with these kinds of credit scores? And I, and I relate that to a lot of, there's a lot of problems behind that kind of a comment, right? From a coach perspective, I see a lot of issues, but I want to ask you specifically about credit and credit challenge clients. What do, what do you do with them? Because I know a lot of loan officers and realtors too want to really, really help people, right? And they're saying, but I really want to help them. You can't make money helping people that, that can't help themselves. And I don't want to sound so brash. No. I don't want to sound so brash in that because I, I have a way that I work with them. But how do you work with them? And do you have a line in the sand that says, you know what, if their credit score is under this, they go into this pile and this is how I communicate versus another pile? I treat every single client the same. So if you come to me and you have a 400 credit score and you're motivated, we're going to go over your credit. We're going to talk about your budget. We're going to get you in smart steps. We're going to educate you. You'll be on an on uh, an ongoing drip campaign. We'll follow up with you every 30 days. I mean, look, people don't want to have bad credit. I mean, no. there's certain people that, I mean, it's like habitual, but most people just don't know the fundamentals and they have no idea. Right. And it's not like it's taught anywhere. People don't get it. Right. And, um, I, so for me, I mean, look, there's a reason that they loan down to 580. And a lot of these people with the right education, the right home buyer education class, the right tools will be super successful homeowners. So, you know, um, I think it's extremely judgmental to say that, you know, you've got nine applications and only one of them qualified. How ungrateful. Like we, I mean, look, when our hands are out, we say please and we say thank you. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of somebody's journey right? Because there's so many, I mean, there's like 500,000 loan officers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I just think that, you know, the more education that we can put out there, the more tools that we can give people, you know, the more willing they are, right. To one, complete them. And then two, to refer your friends and family, like talk about impact. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. 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 No, I, and I, and I learned, you know, I actually learned that lesson long, 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 long time ago, <laughs> a really long time ago, maybe 30 some years ago. Um, I got a loan for, and now I, an understanding, you know, back then, I mean, I bought my house for $45,000. It's selling for, you know, 300 now. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I find I did a loan for $67,000, right? It was a really low loan amount. And I was like, ah, oh, these low loan amounts, these people who put down so much money, right? But I can draw a filled out uh, leaf, a leaf filled oak tree from that one deal of referrals, right? You know, like they, they sent them and they sent them. And I mean, it just a big oak tree filled with this one $67,000 loan. So you never know. My question is, um, do you, do you just stay in touch with these clients forever, even if they never churn yes. into something? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know I was just curious because I know a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, how to segment and, and work with them. So, so I, I had something called, a CRM. you know what I, I mean? Had, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You need good technology to help you with long-term follow-ups like that. So yeah, that's where systems come in. Right. Yeah. Um, so I had something called the home buyer club. That's what I did. And so anyone who couldn't buy today for whatever reason, credit, and I didn't do it just credit people it was credit. I need to get divorced. I need to get married. I need to have a baby. I need to get a new job, right? Whatever it was, I put them in a home buyers club where I did education a lot like what you're talking about now. It's a, and Later, it became a group on Facebook where they could be part of the home buyer club. And I would just educate, educate, educate in there until they were ready to pull the trigger, you know. So I think that's really um, cool as well. So the last question I want to ask you today, and then I want to ask if you want to share anything as well, is um, the software that you're using today, not your LOS, not your CRM, none of that stuff. I just, when you think about a tool that you have that you just absolutely couldn't live without, what is that tool for you today? Salesforce. Yeah. It is a CRM. <laughs> I couldn't live without it. Yeah. Um, it's, so for us, I've spent a lot of time and money in developing our own. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our own instance, but it's really like how my team, it replaces Slack, Asana. So it's task management, it's communication, it's um, follow-up, it's consistency. I mean, I couldn't say enough nice things. In fact, I own stock in it because I love it so much. 
Yeah, I love it too. I love it too. I'll tell you about it offline. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it now, but I'll tell you about it offline. So um, what advice would you be giving to someone? Um, and you already gave some advice right now, you know, on how to do engagement um, during during uh, COVID and what, what's happening now. But as we're looking forward, you know, beyond the pandemic, when we're all released back out. And so if someone's listening to this and we've already been released and we're in stage, you know, three or four, we're out. <laughs> we're finally out and we're not anticipating it coming back. Uh, what would you recommend that someone say, you know, if they struggle through this to now, you got to get your act together and you need to do this. What would you tell someone? You missed it last time. Better not miss it again. What would you tell them? I think you just have to start now. Um, the first 20 videos you put out, no one watched them. So honestly, get your crappy content out ASAP. Yeah. Um, it's like it's more in your head than anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, you just have to really figure out what you're passionate about providing value with. And then it's easy. If you focus on what other people are doing and copying other people, it'll always be difficult. But if you can really look within and figure out what things you're the most passionate about, I promise you, you'll provide value. You'll attract an audience who wants to love and help you because you're providing so much value back. Yeah, I love that. I love so, that. What books are you reading right now? If any, you're so busy right now. What, what books are you reading right now? Um, um, so I am reading, um, well, I just started it. I'm reading fiction, so I'm reading Normal People by Sally Rooney. <laughs> good for you. No, uh, I mean, and sometimes you need that. You know what I do? I watch Too Cute on TV because I just need, I don't like fiction books. <laughs> but I've been watching Too Cute, which is just puppies and kitties, so I can just laugh and giggle and smile. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, there's so much self-development out there, you know. Uh, last self-development book I read was uh, Marie Forleo on Everything is Figure Outable. I thought that was really good. Nice. I like that. I've never heard of that one. Everything is Figure Outable. Yes. I love that. Any favorite quotes you have? Yeah, Passion Changes Everything is a huge one for me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, no, I mean... I have funny sayings, like the only one that comes to mind is my mentor used to tell me, you can't get chicken salad out of chicken shit. <laughs> so I was <laughs> so funny. That it's just like every time I think of my favorite quote, that one's just immediately there. It comes to you. That's okay. I love that. Yeah, I love that. That is funny. That's funny. Well, well they always tell me that about like not doing the, my best job the first time. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, um, and how do you feel about that? I mean, like you were saying, get your crappy videos out and stuff. You know, always there's a great quote. I mean, and Les Brown says it is, you know, you, you, um, oh gosh, and I'm trying to think what he says. And I had it in my head just a few minutes ago. It is, um, you don't have to be great to start. You have to start to be great. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. It's always about effort and intention. If the yeah. effort was there and the intention was to provide value, then you knocked it out of the ballpark. You'll get better, right? Yeah. But where yeah. you are today is your best today won't be your best tomorrow. And so you just have to really focus on what is the best today and putting that out. Yeah. Unbelievable. It doesn't have to be the best though. It's your best today. It's your best. Yeah. Because I think my, big, my biggest competitor was never some other loan officer down the street. It was me. I'm my biggest competitor. My, I want to be better than I was today, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, I want to be better than I was today, and I want to be better than I was yesterday. So I'm my, my competitor, you know, to make that better. So what's the future hold for you? You know, I don't know. I would love to have um, a really big educational, you know, um, educational business, kind of like Dave Ramsey has. Mm -hmm. You know, I love where I work. I love my company. I mean, I don't really know. I think sky's the limit, right? I'm just not really putting any limitations on it. Yeah, you're just having lots of fun now. <laughs> lots of fun. And you have how many kids? Three? I have three children. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And how old are they? Seven, four, and one. Oh, my goodness. The same age as my grandkids. Six, oh four, and two right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no, I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Yeah, so how are they handling uh, COVID right now? just the same way that normal kids are they're going bananas yeah. really restless. can't wait to get out right are you able to spend time with them mm -hmm. yeah they come to work with me you know 
I mean, I'm home a lot more. I mean, it's just kind of nutty. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Lizzie, for sp spending some time with us and sharing, you know, what you're doing and some of the things that you've done to grow your practice to this unbelievable, you know, congratulatory amount. I mean, how impressive is that? And I, you know, look forward to seeing you on stages together. I'm sure we will um, be able to meet face to face once we can all get back on stages. Um, Again, and, uh, you know, again, I just want to say thank you so much for gracing us with your presence here today. And I want to tell everybody, you know, if you've been listening in on this, please share, share these um, beautiful nuggets with your real estate agents, with your loan officers, you know, what a great way to do a book club, right? A video audio book club where you could sit and listen to these types of things and then take action together on how you're going to implement some of the things that you hear each time. So Lizzie, thank you again for being here. It's been my honor to have you here on our show today. Oh my God. It's seriously my honor too. And thank you so much for the beautiful interview. Thank you. We'll catch you next time on Mortgage Lending Mastery. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Be sure to subscribe to hear more sales tips, ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you with your personal and professional growth to multiply your results in record time. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Wanting more beyond the podcast? Join our Mortgage Lending Mastery membership community where you will find extended interviews with our favorite guests, weekly training, tips, and insider secrets fireside chats with Jen, free content, meet, share, and collaborate with other members, and so much more. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about this exclusive content. Mortgage Lending Mastery is an industry syndicate charter podcast. Industry Syndicate is the first podcast network specifically for the mortgage and real estate industries. Get the Industry Syndicate app in the App Store or Google Play today.